Hi there and welcome to this video in the IBM Cloud Foundation Skills Series. And in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit more about the IBM Cloud Kubernetes service, just to give you a bit of a feel for what it is, um, how it's set out. Uh, and that's just before we go and provision a service and start to work with it in the next video or two. So if I were to describe the IBM Cloud Kubernetes service, um, then I would say that, that it's a uh, cloud service that enables you to quickly create your own Kubernetes cluster of compute hosts, and uh, that then allows you to deploy and manage containerized applications in the IBM Cloud, uh, along with the added assurance that IBM Cloud is a certified Kubernetes provider. Now, of course, if you wanted to, you could build your own Kubernetes service. So you could do that either on premises, or you could use bare metal servers, or you could use virtual machines on IBM Cloud. And basically you could do that by taking the latest Kubernetes build uh, and deploying it. Uh, but there's a lot of work involved in actually doing that. So essentially the IBM Kubernetes service takes away the bother of creating your own Kubernetes service and instead provides uh, a service that get, gives you all of the Kubernetes features of intelligent scheduling, um, self-healing, horizontal scaling, load balancing, and all the other good stuff. Uh, and it actually adds on built-in security and isolation, uh, provides advanced tools that help you manage and secure as well as monitor workloads. Uh, and it basically gives you the ability to make your workloads highly scalable and uh, highly available without actually having to build all that for yourself. So rather than spending days or even um, weeks getting a Kubernetes system up and running, uh, the IBM Cloud Kubernetes service gets you a cluster up and running within a li as little as 10 to 20 minutes. Now let's just briefly touch on the Kubernetes architecture. So um, this is fairly foundational stuff, uh, and it's a good idea just to have this in your head, uh, basically because it will help you understand a bit more about the cluster deployment uh, and also uh, container application deployment later on as well. So this diagram on the right, um, it kind of gives you the architecture overview of a, of a Kubernetes service. So starting with account, um, that's obviously represents your IBM Cloud account. Um, so when you uh, order or provision a service, uh, an IBM Cloud Kubernetes service, it will run within your IBM Cloud account. So next you have the cluster. Um, so the cluster is always made up of a master uh, and one or more worker nodes. So the master node um, is the one that monitors and controls the workers. So when a request is made for resources in the cluster, so for example, if you want to run an application, um, then it's the master node that decides which worker node to use to satisfy the request. Uh, and that will be based on available resources within the worker node. Now, in terms of monitoring the master, well, IBM does that for you as part of the service. Uh, and the master is also replicated as part of the service as well. So the master itself is highly available, which is actually quite important within this service. Now, the worker nodes, as I mentioned, uh, they're monitored and controlled by the master. Uh, the workers themselves are actually compute nodes. So when you provision the service, you define what these compute nodes look like. So that's in terms of CPU and RAM. Uh, and actually how many of them to start off with. So um, this obviously then dictates how large a workload the cluster can actually manage and cope with. Now, if you need to scale um, the worker nodes, then you can easily do that in, uh, in IBM Cloud through the console. Uh, and you can do that by obviously adding more nodes to the cluster. So the worker nodes uh, are then deployed into pools. And uh, pools are basically a way of keeping workers of the same um, flavor together. So when we say flavor, uh, what we're talking about is, is CPU and RAM, um, attached disk configuration, and, and all those kinds of things. So you may decide to run some apps on one particular configuration of worker node, uh, and then another app on a different configuration. And basically, the worker pool is the way to keep those uh, machine types distinct. So again, you can scale the pools as well as the workers within them as well. So next here we have namespaces, and a namespace is basically a way to divide um, resources so that they, so that you can then grant access to them as an administrator. So um, I guess another way to think about a namespace is, is I, I guess, as a project. So let's assume you have three projects. You might have project A, project B, and project C. Uh, 
Um, you can then create a namespace for each of those projects. And then uh, let's say grant access to project A to developer one so that they can do everything they need to do on project A, yet have no access to the resources of project B or project C. So that's basically what a namespace is and that's kind of how, how they're used and what they, what, they, what they do. Now a deployment is a Kubernetes resource where you specify information about other resources which are required to run your application. Um, so the different services that you, you might need, your application might need, um, things like persistent storage, um, CPU and RAM requirements. So, so um, that's what makes up a deployment. So the deployment is itself is actually documented in a YAML file. So YAML starts for uh, YAML ain't uh, markup language, so uh, uh, YAML. Uh, and uh, this file is basically a, a human readable configuration file which uh, you use to make an application or, or some other resource including applications available through Kubernetes. Then we have pods. Uh, now a pod is essentially a deployable unit within a Kubernetes cluster uh, and containerized applications are basically deployed, run and managed in pods. So in most cases, each pod will run a single container, uh, but sometimes a pod will need, uh, will, will actually run multiple containers if an application uh, requires multiple containers that need to be addressed using the same private IP. Uh, and then an app is what is actually running in a pod. So this could be a complete application or it could be part of an application. Uh, so where perhaps an application is made up or composed of multiple microservices with each microservice running as an app in a pod. So hopefully from that you can see how Kubernetes um, then actually goes on to support microservices application or rather microservices architecture by being composed of multiple apps in multiple pods. Uh, of course, each of those pods can be scaled um, depending on the load they're under as well. So um, if one pod um, isn't enough to service all of the users, then uh, you can use uh, auto scalers, for example, um, to, to then create more pods to address the load. Now, lastly on this slide, we have uh, the service component uh, and a service is a Kubernetes resource that groups a set of pods and gives them network connectivity. Uh, and it does that without it actually exposing the, the actual IP address, the private IP address of the pod itself. So the service allows you to make your app available within the cluster uh, or on the public Internet as well. So it's actually quite a, a, an important component. Okay, so that's a bit about the architecture, but what does the uh, the Kubernetes cluster actually run on in terms of uh, in terms of infrastructure? So basically in IBM Cloud, uh, you have a choice. So uh, relating to the worker node, you can either deploy uh, on classic clusters, so that's bare metal servers or classic virtual servers, or you can deploy on virtual private cloud. So if you want to run heavy duty workloads that need, um, you know, truly dedicated capacity or have security requirements um, that actually dictate non-shared hardware, then bare metal servers are going to be um, your best option. Um, you'll probably use classic virtual machines if you want to um, reserve capacity for a discounted price, uh, which at the time of recording you can't do with the VPC. And um, classic also currently provides additional persistent storage options um, over and above those available in VPC. Um, now, I think that over time, uh, VPC will um, inherit the, um, the capabilities of classic virtual servers in terms of, in terms of Kubernetes. Uh, but right now, uh, classic clusters um, actually provide a little bit more functionality in terms of the services that you can put around uh, Kubernetes um, than you can have in virtual private cloud. But as I say, I suspect over time, these differences are going to even out. Now you can choose to deploy your clusters in VPC already. So um, you need to have a VPC already created to actually do this. So I think that the main advantage here is that you can then use um, IAM or Identity and Access Management to, um, to actually manage access to the infrastructure and the cluster and the resources. And it's far easier to do that through IAM than it is through some of the classic access which you need for classic clusters. So um, so there's two different types there. So just to quickly um, recap, 
either classic clusters with bare metal, use bare metal if you if you want to have dedicated resources. Um, you can also use a classic virtual servers and that will give you a, a few more persistent um, storage options or you can use um, VPC uh, and as I say VPC options will probably even out to classic virtual server options over time. So as well as the infrastructure deployment, uh, you also need to consider whether to go for single zone or multi-zone clusters, and this largely relates to your high availability requirements. So because Kubernetes is deployed in a cluster, um, there'll always be some degree of high availability inherent in what's deployed. Um, though of course, if you go for a single node cluster, you know it's very minimal and uh, limited to the master node. So um, you probably wouldn't want to put a production workload on a single node cluster, for example. So if you create a single zone cluster, then you're essentially deploying all of your worker infrastructure in one zone or data center. So assuming you have multiple worker nodes, then if a node fails, the cluster will be resilient to that failure. However, if that node fails, or rather if that zone fails, or connectivity is lost to that zone, then your workload isn't available anymore. So if you want to protect against zone failure, uh, then creating a multi-zone cluster means that your resources are distributed across three zones or data centers in the region. Uh, so that means that a single zone failure won't actually knock out your, your application. Now you can start with a single zone cluster and then upgrade it, so to speak, um, to a, to a multi-zone cluster but only if you place your single zone cluster in a multi-zone region to start with. So if you want to start small and have the ability to spread across zones, then I'd recommend making sure you deploy in a multi-zone region to start with. Now you can, also cons um, you can also scale beyond regions by deploying multiple clusters in multiple regions uh, and, uh, and then use a global load balancer to actually access the applications as shown in the diagram here. Uh, and uh, just to point out as well, the diagram here also just shows North America, but you can, of course, create clusters in single zones and multi-zone regions across the globe. So if you really wanted to create a, a, a multiple cluster with a global load balancer that spans um, locations around the globe, then you can do that if you, if you wanted to. So this is the last slide and one question you might be asking yourself is whether or not you can do any of this for free. Uh, and the short answer is yes. Um, you can create a free single node Kubernetes cluster in IBM Cloud, uh, which will get you started and, uh, and actually give you some practice as well. And I'll show you how to do that in the following videos. So note there are some limitations to the free cluster. Um, the main ones being that you can only run one free cluster at a time in your account. Uh, and that all free clusters are deleted automatically after 30 days. So if you do use one and you want to retain your workload after the 30 day period, uh, you'll need to create a standard cluster and migrate the workload within that period. Okay, and that's it to this introduction to the IBM Cloud Kubernetes service. So in the next video, we're gonna look at uh, actually provisioning a cluster. Uh, we're gonna look at the options and, and actually create a free cluster. Uh, but I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. Please like and feel free to subscribe to my channel if you have. Uh, and I guess all that remains is to say thank you very much for watching. And uh, I look forward to seeing you next time.